This program was brought to you by Kola Institute of Venture at Tel Aviv University. So I was asked to, to come and speak about water ventures, um, and I thought that I should speak in a, in a realistic sense about the opportunities of this area, but also about the various challenges and the realities in this field. Um, and since I'm very much into movies, I thought I'll start with the mentioning of Waterworld. I don't know if you remember or if you have seen, and if you have not seen, consider yourself lucky, uh, <laughs> the movie Waterworld. Waterworld um, came out in 1995. At the time, Kevin Costner was probably the biggest movie star in the world, uh, won also several Oscars. And Waterworld is this uh, dystopian film about um, a world where the most um, uh, pricey commodity is fresh water and soil. And everybody lives in the water. It was shot off the coast of Hawaii. Um, and what was supposed to be you know, a reasonably budgeted film inflated into about $200 million in, uh, that went into the film, which was at the time the most expensive film ever made still to, to this date is one of the 10 most expensive films ever made, and that's 20 years after the film has come out. Um, and that's because they encountered a lot of problems when you shoot in the ocean. And to top all of that, the film got terrible reviews. So at the end of the day, they managed to break even, but uh, let's say that what started Kevin Costner's uh, decline to some extent. And, and, and the point is, I'm, I'm not here to talk about Kevin Costner, obviously. <laughs> it's that um, you need to understand water in order to make money in the water business. And, and I'm coming, and I'll introduce myself in one moment, I'm coming from the angle of, you know, we're all trying to make here water ventures, but at the end of the day, we want them to also be successful financially. And just as a side note, two years after this movie came out, came an even more expensive movie that also dealt with, with water, but it was a very successful movie. If you know which movie that was, Titanic. Okay, so which also tells you that the title of a movie does not mean you know, that it's doomed, some titles. It's a water world, everything sank, Titanic. It floated magnificently, so, okay. Um, so just a quick word about myself. Uh, I'm the CEO of Hutchison Kinrot. Hutchison Kinrot is an incubator in Israel. Uh, we are uh, owned by Hutchison Water. Hutchison Water is the water division of Hutchison Wampoa, which is a Hong Kong company. So also here in a very international uh, uh, sense, Hutchison Wampoa, very briefly, is a Hong Kong conglomerate. It's a Fortune 500 company, uh, ranging from the largest port operator in the world to real estate to uh, retail, actually second largest retailer. and. Um, uh, so one, its uh, news division is Hutchison Water, started about seven years ago. Hutchison Water primarily is a project-oriented company. They uh, constructed the largest desalination plant in the world, also located in Israel, doing a bunch of other projects and uh, doing various uh, investments uh, globally. And as part of that, they also acquired the incubator about two years ago. We operate under uh, the office of the chief scientist in Israel, and we do seed investments in early stage startups. So really, you know, two people coming to us, two, three people coming to us with an idea, and the aim is to turn that idea not just into a product, but turn it into a company at the end of the day. And part of also what we do, we take patents from universities, and I would love to have the opportunity to do that also with Tel Aviv University, since we do it with uh, others in, in Israel, and, and make them a reality in, from a, um, a commercial sense. So, water is a really, it's a huge industry. Um, globally, we're talking about $620 billion uh, worth of industry, so it's, it's huge. I put here a graph that uh, I've taken from uh, uh, Lux Research, and it really shows the, the breakdown of the industry. Um, I hope you can you know, make out what's uh, written here. But you can see that water really 
spreads the, the, the entire field. It has chemicals and materials, integrated systems, construction, equipment, engineering. It really deals with a lot and a lot of issues. You can also see, and I will touch on that later on, that what's uh, shown here as public services is actually quite a considerable part. And I, and I will get to public services because public services and the fact that you deal here uh, in many aspects, uh, your customers are utilities or municipal players is part of the challenges that are different uh, many times than a lot of other sectors in which uh, you invest and make businesses. Um, but the good part is because a lot of times the, the, uh, the, the misconception is that you, know, you cannot make money in the water industry. It's too difficult to make money there and if you invest there you should expect very low returns and, and basically it will never work. And actually the research there shows, uh, as it's stated here, that they took a research of about a quarter of the companies in these industries and what they showed it is that you can uh, get uh, an average operating profit of nearly 13%. And in, some in, and in some sectors, it's even higher than that, which are uh, very nice operating profits. Um, and you can see the customer-facing sectors in public service and small consumer systems also achieve even higher than 14% uh, operating profit. Um, and so what I will try to show here is what you really need to consider when you go into the water sector uh, for you to be successful and be part of these uh, successful companies rather than end, end up as a company that tried but ultimately failed. So what are the challenges? First of all, I think we, we should remember that water is really an undervalued resource. Um, because the allocation of water, and, and I will touch also later on, water is considered really as a, as a human right, as something that's been given from God. Um, and when you look at that in, in that sense, it's very uh, difficult to price water um, in, in the right way. Because you cannot just turn the tap off to people, and, and therefore the price of water doesn't necessarily reflect the amount of money that goes into producing and delivering water. Um, the, the, the table here is, uh, unfortunately, it's, it's rather small, uh, but generally speaking, water prices are kept really lower uh, than sort of the, their price should be. And the result is, and, and I will show you here on, on this graph, uh, the result is, if you look, for example, the United States, that the, the water use is, is really quite high uh, as opposed to, to the price. So you get an, uh, an overuse of this resource on the one hand. On the other hand, you, you have financial constraints on the utilities providing that, uh, the, the water because they simply cannot charge enough money to make up for the cost that they put into it. But then you see other countries, which like you know Denmark, where the price is very high, and you see how it affects uh, the, the the price, uh, the the use of water. Um, for example, I think in Portugal, um, the price of water is around uh, half a euro per uh, right. It's 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 heav heavily subsidized. Um, in Israel, it's actually it's it's much higher. But um, I I would also say. Um, that generally speaking, the, the, the era of, of cheap water is probably going to end. If you look at the U.S. that has experienced some severe drought conditions over the past uh, few years, especially in, in states like Texas or California, you see slowly but surely the prices of water is, is creeping up, and, and there is a reason to it. Another thing to remember is that water is a very capital-intensive industry. And here you see... Um, um, a comparison to other industries. So even if you look at the electric or gas distribution, it's significantly higher. So it's uh, 3.5, uh, the, the ratio of capital to, rev to revenue, which means you need to put three and a half dollars in order to make one dollar. That's, you know, when you, when you think of it, and, and I'm talking here very, you know, a, a broad uh, figures, that's, that's something quite amazing. Um, so, you know, here, here's what it's saying, and that's creating slowly but surely a financing gap because, again, utilities are also businesses at the end of the day. Uh, they need to, to finance uh, the work they do. So th there are only, uh, only several solutions that you can do in order to make up for this financing gap. 
Either you, know, you reduce your spendings on operations and management, uh, or you limit the procurement uh, of new CapEx intensive technology. I will, I will later explain how that also affects ventures in this field, because if you're a capital intensive venture and you try to sell to utilities who don't have the money uh, or are very um, financially aware of you know, where they allocate the money, that also affects your ability to penetrate the markets. Um, and, and the result is that the uh, water utilities need continuous access to funding sources. Another issue is fragmentation of the, the industry. I, see, I think also here in Portugal you have a lot of different water utilities and once in, in, in the US for example there are around 45,000 uh, water providers um, but only around 8% of which uh, provide water for about 85% of the population. So think about all the small utilities that it's very difficult for them to come together and, and to make the the uh, consolidation that is required. And as a result, they're small. They cannot really make the required investments in order, in order to improve, to become more efficient. And that also afterwards um, creates a challenge to ventures in this field that have these utilities as their customers. Um, and, and finally, and this is sort of a part of what I've been talking about, the, there is a whole notion of shifting from CapEx to OPEX, meaning that you need to find some very um, imaginative or very uh, sophisticated financial uh, paradigms in order to make it possible for water utilities to acquire the technology that you want to sell. So, for example, instead of uh, selling it to them, you lease it or you make uh, or you participate in part of the energy savings that you put in. There are a lot of different models and uh, those depend on the, uh, on the specific type of venture. The next point is that of a conservative market. Water market is conservative. It's a conservative industry by nature. First of all, because you have a very risk-averse client base. To start with, when you're dealing with the public sector, public sector is risk-averse. Uh, you know, they say that n no one got punished for not doing something, right? It's when you take, it's when you take a decision t that someone can say, hey, wh why, did you, why did you decide to incorporate a new technology first? Second of all, if you're dealing with people who've done the same thing for 20 years, there are a, lot of, a lot of time there is a mentality of it ain't, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Okay, it's working, what do you want? Why change something? Um, the, the next aspect is, is that um, you have also um, a public health issue when you come to water, right? Water, once you touch water, you need to get all these different um, uh, certificates uh, in, in, in hand. You're always worried that uh, there is something for example, in the material that you put into water that later dissipates into the water system. So it also makes for a very regulatory intensive um, uh, industry. Then there are all the tender rules. If you want to sell to a public utility, you need to go through a public tender, at least in most countries, where you have uh, laws that prescribe that they cannot just go out and buy a certain technology without showing that there is a public tender. And when you're an early, when you're an early stage startup, and you don't have a lot of money, I mean, just to, to go through this cumbersome process, it takes time, time takes money, and by the time you manage to reach the market, you may, as well, you may be dead in the water, so to speak. Um, and, and that's the next point here, which is the, really the long purchase and investment cycles in this industry. Um, and, and the market is a very complex market, and water uh, ventures need to understand that. The next aspect is technological issues. Um, water, you know, if you say water is water is water, that's not, that's not really the case. Water is different in each location. You know, the salinity of water in the Mediterranean is different from the salinity of water in the Atlantic Ocean, and one ocean is not similar to another ocean. Uh, when you go to uh, wastewater treatment plants, the, the wastewater that you treat has different uh, TOC and BOD levels. Um, it's, it's just a very, uh, complex substance to use. It's not, you know, when you say electricity, it, it's electricity. Water is different. And therefore, when you start touching uh, water and dealing with water, the fact that you've run certain experiments on water 
in one location does not mean that it will be necessarily immediately applicable to whatever you do in, when you export your technology to another country. You need to take um, account of this factor. Second is, and that's the reason there are people here from different fields, and I think we also mentioned uh, uh, in, in, your, in your speech about uh, Tel Aviv University and uh, bringing together people from uh, multi-disciplines, uh, uh, is that in water you really get this confluence of, um, of uh, disciplines. You get uh, people working from chemistry and physics and engineering and biology, and, and you run into issues. For example, you know, we, we have a company, one of the companies we invest in, deals with treatment of uh, chemical contaminants, and it was operating in a, in a, in, in a water well. Um, and so this is really a, a chemistry-oriented company, but then it had to deal with the issue of biofouling uh, that happened uh, when they were treating uh, the water there. So it's, it's, uh, it's all the time you need to think of the different angles, which makes it just that much more complicated. Um, I touched on, on the one point where, you know, if you adopt it in one location, doesn't mean that it's also in, in another location. And then the last point is that because of the very complex nature of water, sometimes when you solve a problem in one place, you actually create a problem in another place. Uh, so, for example, sometimes when you treat um, um, underground water in one area, because underground water shifts to other areas, it uh, impacts the... Um, uh, the makeup of the water in that other area, and you can create a whole new problem over there. So uh, it's, it's all these issues that you need to take into account, which also makes the, the life cycle of the water venture that much slower when you compare it, for example, you know, to just uh, application that you put on your mobile phone, uh, which is not to, you know, to downplay uh, that industry. I'm just saying in the water industry, of course, there are other issues. Um, then there are the, finan the financing challenges. So if you look at water ventures, typically the time to maturity is around eight to 10 years. Eight to 10 years is a very long time to sustain a company. It's a very long time to, uh, for your investors to have the horizon and the patience in order to bring a product to the market and understand what's needed for a company just to break even in that sector. Um, so you have the amounts that are required, uh, not just for, you know, for R&D, then you go into manufacturing. This is a field where a lot of time you have real hardware, so you need to uh, go and, 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 and produce uh, um, uh, real equipment, you, uh, and, and real equipment, you know, it creates time. It's a big infrastructure-related uh, uh, business, so that's also uh, an issue. And then the market penetration, which I mentioned before, when you're dealing with a conservative industry, it takes time, long purchase cycle. This also translates into money that you need to put into the ventures. And so one of the problem is that VCs, uh, and there are not that many VCs in this uh, area, they typically look for, you know, very um, uh, defined, strong exit potentials. I mean, the first thing that the VC looks for when they come to invest in, vo in, a, in, a, in a venture is how do they exit the venture. Um, and, and so you need to really uh, make it clear to them what's the path to exiting that venture. Uh, and when you're dealing with something, especially in early stage investment, we were saying, yes, I mean, it's likely to be eight, nine, or 10 years from now, that's, it's not necessarily a deal breaker, but it also limits and narrows down the fields of potential investors. There are not that many angel investors in water for a reason. Uh, there are not that many uh, VC investors in water. There are, of course, but when you compare it to a lot of other industries, uh, it's significantly um, lower. Then I mentioned, and, 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 and you know, sometimes I repeat myself, but it's because it really touches on various aspects, the, the whole uh, uh, capital expenditure constraints of, uh, your, uh, of the clients in the water business. And finally, as I mentioned, there are v the number of VCs, the number of private equity uh, funds dealing with water is just, it's just much smaller. Um, so we are, for example, the, the largest uh, seed investor in water-related uh, ventures uh, in, in the world. But when we look around, there are not that many uh, out there, unfortunately. Um, and then, you know, the, the regulation uh, I mentioned before, so I'm not going to, uh, to talk about some of the points here. 
Um, but then uh, th there are a couple of points here that I do want to uh, dwell on. First of all is when you, ha when you don't have the regulation, sometimes it's really it's a barrier to entry into the market. Because if, for example, you're coming to um, a certain utility and you tell them, look, I can really reduce uh, the level of contaminants in your water. And they say, that's great, but legally, we're not required to do that. So, you know, we're fine with what we have. Um, so, you know, in an ideal world, we'll say, well, you know, we want to have the best out there, but when you have also a cash-constrained um, client base, they're going to tell you, we're going to do what we have to do. Uh, and you need to understand that about the mentality. Um, on the other hand, sometimes regulation drives innovation and drives adoption of technology. Um, then there are also significant liability issues. Because you're dealing here with public health related um, ventures, if something goes wrong and, and when you're trying to introduce a new technology, you're going to have the, your client tell you, I want you to assume full responsibility and take all the liability if something here doesn't go well. Uh, which again, for an early stage startup, to assume that kind of responsibility is not trivial at all. Um, and, and finally, uh, and, and you know, you're going to have uh, uh, Zev, the CEO of uh, one of our portfolio companies, also talk about non-revenue water and how that also drives adoptions. You can use uh, regulation at your benefit. So if, for example, the lower the, um, the percentage that is allowed for non-revenue water, meaning the amount of water coming into um, a water system versus the amount coming out to the customers or a certain pollutant concentration, that is actually a benefit. Um, okay, so if I stopped here, you would say, that's great, let's leave now, uh, and uh, why, why on earth are you investing in, in the water business? But um, again, think Titanic, okay? N not Waterworld, Titanic. Um, so let's look at some of the, the current investment trends in, in this area. And this, is, uh, this pie chart shows um, around, around 1,200, you know, it, it doesn't really matter if it's uh, a couple hundred more or less, but startups in, in this area. And I think it's interesting to look at uh, the makeup of this. So I'll, I'll, I'll assist all of, it's, it's not a, you know, a, a reading test, so I'll assist you in, in reading. Uh, you see a quarter here is in the monitoring, forecast and control, which, which uh, alludes to the area of what we call today smart water networks, which is a very big growing area, um, and I will later talk about it. Then you have again about a quarter with organic nutrients and solids treatment, so it's all that area also of wastewater treatment, um, but also uh, deals with a lot of the wastewater streams coming, for example, from mining industry, from oil and gas, and other industries. Uh, you see um, metals, organic removal recovery. Again, that's quite in, in that uh, same area. Uh, you see desalination, you see disinfection, and then you have a lot of other, other uh, areas here, which again, that, you know, you can have certain areas, for example, leak repair ties itself to the smart water networks because ultimately it's about identifying leaks and then what do you do about it. So some things are here sort of, uh, they're shown in different category but they are really interrelated. Um, but, but this is, you know, generally the snapshot of what's going on today. So first I'll talk about the smart water networks. The situation you have today with water, although it's very capital intensive, is that basically we know so little of what's going on in the water system once we put the pipe in the ground. And if you think about it, it's completely different than today you have the smart grid and electricity, everything is monitored, uh, we're used to carrying around our mobile phone and people know where we are, where we checked in, who we paid to, everything is known, and, but in this kind of very um, capital intensive industry, you put the pipe in the ground and it becomes a stupid pipe so to speak. Um, and this, but this is slowly changing. The whole trends of smart cities, where cities try to become smarter in the way that um, they uh, manage the entire universe of what they do, be it um, uh, transportation, or even uh, um, you know, picking up the garbage, or, or other stuff, you see more and more sensors 
going into or under uh, the ground or relating to things going on underground in order to provide the information for the water utility. And actually, again, Aquarius was, is one example. Um, so some of the hot issues include leakage, simply because uh, water, once the price of water starts rising, that's also uh, financially, uh, it's lost revenue for the water utility, but also from the aspect of making preventive, smart preventive maintenance, inaccurate billing, uh, network inefficiency, inefficiency, this all translates into money. The money that is really uh, required by uh, the industry in trying to improve their balance sheet. Um, but smart water network, it's still, it's very early on and that's the reason you see today more and more um, startups flocking into this area simply because it's really about to grow very significantly. So. Um, I put here a graph that shows uh, the, uh, the market forecast for uh, smart water networks in early adopters versus other countries in the next, it was here it starts 2011, but it goes on for the next uh, four or five years. You see uh, the amount there is really, it's, it's a very large amount uh, that goes in there. And this is part of the reason that it's of so much interest and also becoming um, uh, more and more of an hot, a hot issue, especially as you get more of the drought condition in certain countries. There is a pressure, a pressure on the utilities, a pressure by the regulators to, to show what are you doing in order, in order to improve this. Um, here, when you look at the market forecast in various uh, regions around the world, you see that it's not just, you know, one of those things where we say, oh, you know, it's just going to interest people in Western Europe and in, uh, in the U.S. Uh, actually, the, the largest segment here is the East Asia, Pacific, uh, North America, uh, Western Europe, but also in, in other regions around the world. So this is something that is really a very uh, growing uh, trend. Um, then when we have the sector breakdown, and I realize uh, you cannot really <laughs> read this here, it, 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 it really is uh, the number, the, the total number here of, of three billion, um, it breaks down into a lot of different uh, issues. Um, so you can do it with the, uh, um, if, if we break down sort of the, uh, the various, um, I would say the architecture of what is meant by smart water networks. So you can get at the base, you get the sensors, uh, then you get you know, the energy sources for that, you get the algorithms uh, that are looking into analyzing and interpreting uh, the, uh, the data. So at, at the very top, you can see the likes of Cisco and IBM. At the very bottom, you see you know, maybe uh, smaller companies, but it's, it's an area where you see uh, companies of various sizes and various shapes uh, flocking in. So to give you an example from one of our uh, portfolio companies, um, it's a company called Hydrospin, and essentially think of it this way. We want to put sensors in the water pipe and to transmit the data. That's fantastic, but in order to power the sensors, you need electricity. Try to make the water utility speak to the electricity company and put together electricity in a certain spot. That's a challenge. Uh, it's a challenge both from just even uh, uh, getting them to you know, work together. It's a challenge because it takes money and, and quite a significant sum if you have the pipe on that side of the street, but your electricity pole is on this side of the street, and now you have to dig under the street and connect it. Um, so, and in some areas, you just don't have the electricity available. So you're going to say, okay, let's put battery packs. But battery packs are, can only allow you to transmit data maybe once a day, uh, and then you have to change the battery pack, so you need to go again. You know, each time go to all the locations and uh, replace the battery packs, or you put solar panels, uh, and solar panels are, first of all, it's, it's weather-based. Second of all, it's uh, great for thieves. Thieves, for some reason, love solar panels. I don't know what they do with it, but it's, uh, um, so the idea here is really, it's, it's, it's very simple. Why don't you use the water already flowing in the pipes in order to generate the electricity to power the sensors? Uh, and this is what this company does. So you see there is a little micro generator um, uh, here. It goes into, into the pipe. Uh, this, uh, 
is um, applicable to pipes ranging from right now from three inch to uh, 80 inch pipes. Uh, there is a rechargeable battery. You can put it in and take it out. It's uh, uh, without disrupting the water uh, flow in, in the system so you don't have to shut off the, the water going uh, into the city. And that way you can allow utilities to choose where they want rather, wh rather than where they can put their sensors. And it's, uh, it's a very green solution, it's very available, and it's much more cost effective than to, put, uh, to connect it to the electricity. So this is an example to a company which we invested in and currently it's already in, in pilot uh, mode in Israel and about to, to start uh, sales. Um, the next trend is that of everything that deals with water and energy nexus. So I mentioned before that you know, water, we, we have a perception of water, which is water is a human right. Water is something that we ought to provide to people. But when you look at energy, and I, you know, and I asked you about energy, you're gonna say, well, energy is big business, right? Energy, it's fine that you have the energy price increase. Uh, it's, it's different than water. A lot of people look at it uh, differently. And that's why uh, also the way it is perceived globally is that energy into energy, mostly you have private players rather than uh, the municipal players that you have in the water uh, sectors. And it also drives much more investment there. However, water and energy are really, they're tied in together. You need energy in order to produce the water, in order to, to pump the water out. You need energy in order to put all the sensors uh, in there in order to distribute the water. But uh, then you also need uh, water for the energy sector because if you want to cool down all the energy plants, if you want to, for example, um, all the, the oil drillings, you need about at least uh, between three and six barrels of water just to produce one barrel of oil. So you need a lot of water. So they're tied in together, but then again, there is this really uh, gap in, in the perception and also in the um, amounts of money going in there. And if you see the water use by category, and that's uh, for the US, you see that half of the water use in the US is used for uh, thermoelectric power. You know, you think about it, that's half of the water in the US is actually tied into energy. And then if you look also in, you know, in other areas like irrigation, stuff like that, you'll see there is also you know, an energy component there. And the result is that when you, you, know, when you consider the, the investments, and this is, this is even clean energy, right? This is not your traditional energy. Um, so this is global investments from 2000 to 2013. So it provides you with really you know, a, a long period of time. You see that globally, look at the amounts that go into clean energy versus the amounts that go into water. It's, it's a fraction of uh, what they are. Although you know, when you look at the, uh, who the investors are, actually the, the, uh, the pie chart is quite similar. It's not that you know, in, in the, you see completely different investors in the water sector from, from event, you know, whether they're venture capital or public sector or corporations, et cetera, than you do in uh, the, the clean energy. But then there is just that much more money going into clean energy. And there was also this uh, uh, hype and then bust, for example, in the solar panel um, industry, if you, you were aware of that. But still, uh, this is one example. Then you have also, when, if you look at the number of deals, uh, over that same period of time, again, you know, the same, same picture. Um, and, but I think that this is also, you know, slowly uh, starting to change. But the main point here is that if you're going into water venture, one, one of the hot areas is everything that deals with energy. Because then you're benefiting from this side of the stream uh, for your water ventures simply because it's tied to all the electricity component. Um, again, this is basically you know, uh, what I was saying. Um, especially today, for example, when you look at, it's less so in Europe, but more in North America, fracking, um, uh, SAG-D, uh, uh, you know, bitumen sands, et cetera. Um, there are, because there are water shortages and dwindling supplies, of water, the whole issue of how do you reuse the water? How do you make more with the less that you have is a big issue. And companies are willing to pay if you come with a solution that solves that. 
Um, and there is also stricter regulation. Because you have uh, competing um, demands over the water uh, that is available, because water is not just for electricity, it's for irrigation, it's for municipal water, it's for a lot of other uses, you have stricter and stricter regulations that even the energy companies uh, need to uh, address. And that's where it also there is the high interest from the venture capitals, from the corporate players, from the big companies that are willing, they, they have the money available. They just want you to come with the right solution in order to solve their problems. It doesn't have to be altruistic, it just an, it means it's good business for them. And, and another aspect is that here you're dealing with a client base that is not um, municipal or utility or public sector, you're dealing with private companies. So private companies, generally they can move faster and have the whole adoption investment cycle to be uh, much more condensed. Um, so again, here, for example, uh, one of the companies that we invested in, in in the last year, a company called Solex, and it's a new treatment technology for produced water exactly for this oil and gas industry because, uh, you know, because it's something that uh, we find to be very interesting. So I won't you know, uh, dwell on that too much. Um, wastewater treatment, again, another, another hot issue uh, that we see. It's a, it's a global market around the world. And, and, and the market also where you have the opportunities for a lot of uh, small scale uh, players. Um, and, and this is just to show you how innovation is also tied with, uh, you know, with, the, with the market. So you see the very sharp increase in the patent applications, for example, in desalination, which because of the water shortages, you get more and more desalination plants globally. And uh, you see the real big spike in uh, the number of uh, water innovation in that specific field. Um, and, and finally, you know, there is some uh, information on patent filings in uh, uh, water purification. Again, you see the trend going up. So water gets more and more innovation coming into it. I think in that sense, it's very promising. You just need to identify the right sectors. Um, some more considerations, you know, to think about. Uh, first is product versus service. Which is, which is always a big issue for, for companies. What are you selling? Are you selling a product or are you selling a service? Sometimes you're trying to sell both of them. Um, and here, you, again, we need to understand because water is so complex, because of all the reasons I stated before, um, a lot of the clients, what they want is someone to, it's not handhold them, but to be there in the adoption cycle of the technology. So you need to take that into account when you think I'm just going to sell a product, a lot of times the clients will actually require you to be there and, and to help them out. And that can also be true when you're dealing with municipalities where, again, you want to teach uh, an old dog new tricks, so help them by you know, being very supportive, and then you can also charge money for that. Um, the flip side is that a lot of time venture capital firms, they prefer just you know, something that you sell, it's a plug and play, um, technology rather than something that requires service because service is also more capital intensive. You need more people um, in place, etc. So again, it's, there is always a tension between these two aspects. Market penetration. Um, I cannot overstate uh, how important it is to get this right. Um, first of all, in, in the area of water, because it's so complex, it's so important to start at your home base. It's much easier to fix problems that are two hours drive than a five hours flight. Um, and you also generally, it's, it's easier to convince someone to let them try out your product uh, when it's in the same geography, same mentality, etc. Second is because of the financial issues, the more you can use government grants, uh, and there are plenty of government grants, by the way, in, 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 in this area, uh, the better. It can convince otherwise hesitant clients to say, you know what, we're willing to take a chance and to, uh, and to try out the technology simply because their, their stake in the game financially is lower. Third is to understand that as, just as water, not all water is created alike, not all water utilities, for example, are created alike. There are innovators and there are those who are laggers or you know, just uh, do not have the um, entrepreneurship uh, DNA. 
Um, so sometimes you need to understand which of the water utilities in your sectors are ones where they're going to push for innovation, where they want to show the public because of a customer service aspect, because it's part of you know the the uh, um, uh, agenda of the people at the top there that they want to bring in new technologies. So that's also crucially important. And then there is technology versus marketing focus. A lot of times we see companies that say, you know, we're going to get the technology perfect and then we're going to start the marketing, which sometimes can also mean you're going to get a fantastic technology, but by then you're going to run completely out of money and will not be able to get to the market. On the other hand, you cannot burn yourself by coming to the market with a half-baked product that is going to fail um, during first operation. Then it creates this uh, very negative reputation and you're going to kill the company. So there needs to be a balance between the two. Uh, you need to feel sufficiently confident, but then again, you cannot expect to get it you know, completely perfect. You need to be, also take uh, some form of calculated risk. Um, and, and the last point here is that you need to talk to your next investors early on. Um, any investment takes time. No, no investment takes a month or two. Typically it can take six months or even a year. But you want your next uh, investors to be uh, really very strongly engaged in the company, in what you're doing, to understand the technology, even if they, you know, they go through the uh, uh, abs and flows of, of, the, of, the, uh, of your venture, that's fine. Um, and here, uh, you know, because, because the perception is that there are not a lot of uh, activity in terms of VC and M&A activity in this uh, sector, um, I put in the slide to show you, you know, the past uh, six years. And, and what you see, and, uh, and, and maybe it's a, this looks like a, a heart attack uh, graph, uh, but it, it, it's not. Actually, if you look at the trend from 2009, to 2013, here you have uh, both the, the number of the, the, deal, the deal volume and the amount. Um, uh, and, and this is also, this shows the average sizes in, in water venturing. Uh, and you know, even realizing that we had a financial crisis in the middle of all of that, right? That's also something that we need to, to bear in mind. Um, I, I helped you out and I, I uh, put the figures together. But you know, if, if you look at it, ultimately, you see a consistent increase, actually, in the deal numbers and the deal volume from 2009 through to, uh, 2013. And it, it rose quite significantly. So uh, um, basically, it doubled uh, from just uh, under 250 millions to near 500 uh, millions over that period. Uh, and though the last quarter of 2014, there may be some uh, decrease, overall, when you look at the average deal size, it remained the same. Um, and actually, when you look at the growth stage uh, deals, they've increased in average from 9 million in 2012 to 15 million to in 2014, which also means you have more water ventures surviving the, the, the life cycle because then you have more ventures to invest in that will require more money. So that's a, that's a positive trend. Um, and again, I know that the uh, sector is receiving investments uh, uh, particularly uh, again, you see here the oil and gas, wastewater treatment, resource recovery, um, et cetera. And, and finally, um, you know, to give an example of uh, notable M&A, so this was uh, venture capital, so the earlier stage of investments. When you look at mergers and acquisitions in this field, um, for example, just uh, last year, you had a significant acquisition by a very large uh, uh, corporate player, LG uh, Kim, uh, acquired uh, Nano H2O, which manufactures uh, RO membranes for the salination industry. I think generally when you look here, you'll, you'll see a lot of uh, membrane-related companies. So that hints to, if you remember the slide about growth in patents of the salination-related uh, innovation, everything ties in together. But I think one of the interesting facts here, how long did it take them from incorporation until the sale? And I mentioned before about eight to 10 years. So you see here nine years. Um, when you look at Inge Water Technologies, that's the one at the bottom that was acquired by BASF in 2011, 11 years from incorporation. It takes time in this industry. Again, uh, this is an industry that requires uh, patience, 
Um, you don't see that many uh, IPOs, so uh, public offerings on stock exchanges. Generally speaking, for uh, water ventures, uh, that's not something that is uh, very common in this industry. But you do see some, uh, some spin-offs. Uh, you, you, you do see some very significant um, acquisitions. And um, ultimately, I think this trend will increase simply because you know, water will remain a top issue. Um, recently, there was a, from the World Economic Forum in Davos, water was recognized as the number one problem uh, and, and a challenge in the world. This will not go away. It's something that is here to stay. And, and for that reason, uh, we strongly believe in investing in water ventures throughout. Uh, we, we invest across the entire uh, uh, sector. We think there are very interesting technologies. Obviously, not everything can be successful, but successes can be made. Uh, you know, you, when you jump into the pool of water uh, sector, so you don't need to jump at the, at the deep end, uh, but you need to understand what's going on in, in that pool in order to really swim and uh, be successful. And I encourage you know, all of you to uh, continue the work you're doing in this field and uh, make it a very successful one. Thank you very much. This program was brought to you by Collar Institute of Venture at Tel Aviv University.